Support for this program comes from the Lincoln Academy of Illinois 2019 Friends. Information available at the Lincoln Academy of Illinois.org slash 2019 dash friends. From the State Capitol Building in Springfield, Illinois, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois presents its 55th annual Convocation and Investiture of Laureates. Since 1965, the nonpartisan, not for profit Lincoln Academy of Illinois has honored more than 300 people who have brought honor to their state in the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. Each spring, the laureates of the Lincoln Academy are presented by the governor with the state's highest award for individual achievement, the Order of Lincoln Medallion. The Lincoln Academy also recognizes leaders of the future by honoring outstanding senior students at each of the state's four-year degree granting institutions of higher learning and ceremonies held each fall at the Old State Capitol in Springfield. We gather tonight to recognize uncommon achievement by illuminating the stories of leadership and generosity that have defined our honorees and their contributions. Their pioneering work and selfless civic engagement have profoundly shaped the vibrancy of the cultural, technological, scientific, and economic fabric of our state, our nation, and our world. Because receiving the Order of Lincoln, our state's highest honor, carries the name and enduring legacy of arguably our greatest president and his profound impact on the shaping of our nation. Legacies are complex because we are complex. The timeless relevance of Abraham Lincoln lies in the greatness of his character. And as a result, it requires that we consciously bring his legacy and unfinished work both into this room tonight and into our lives. Jerry Colangelo's name is synonymous with leadership in the sports industry and various business interests. He credits his foundation about hard work, commitment, family, and faith from growing up in a working class neighborhood in Chicago Heights. After playing collegiate basketball and baseball for the University of Illinois, Colangelo began his NBA career in the front office of the Chicago Bulls. He would then become the youngest general manager in professional sports with the 1968 expansion team, the Phoenix Suns. He later became an owner of the team. He was the first managing director of USA Basketball Men's Senior National Team Program helping restore the USA to gold medal status. Colangelo's impact goes far beyond the sports world. He has made a positive impact on many through his service on dozens of boards, charitable and community organizations, receiving many awards and recognitions. He has also helped establish the Colangelo School of Sports Business. To receive the Order of Lincoln from Carmel, California, Jerry Colangelo. One of the most innovative and influential owners in NBA history, Jerry Colangelo has been involved with basketball for most of his life. Colangelo started his career in the Chicago Bulls front office in 1966. See, the NBA was, uh, was a mom and pop league back then. There were only eight teams. And so um, Chicago was the first expansion team of the modern era before it expanded to 30 teams, which we have in the NBA today. Um, it wasn't a slam dunk in Chicago, but uh, the reason we named them the Bulls is that the first year we had to play at the old amphitheater, and uh, we just thought it would have a, a great uh, connectivity between the Bulls and City of Chicago. In fact, the logo is one that was designed by a friend of mine back then, and it's the only logo in the NBA that's never changed. After spending time with the Bulls, Colangelo ventured forward in his career by moving out west with his family. 
Colangelo became the general manager for a new team that was being added to the NBA. This new team would later be known as the Phoenix Suns. There were two teams added the following year in 67 and then two more in 68. And uh, Milwaukee and Phoenix were the two franchises awarded in 68. I was offered both jobs as a GM, uh, except at Phoenix. Uh, and at that time, I was the youngest GM in pro sports. And, um, you know, I, I left Chicago with uh, nine suitcases, $300 in my pocket, three young kids, two, four, and six, and a wife. And uh, we never looked back. Colangelo would go on to lead the Suns to great successes in the team's early stages to help the franchise gain respect in its new league. We made the playoffs in yet our second year of operation and established ourselves. And so, you know, five years later, we played for the championship. So we, we were very fortunate, and I was, again, very blessed in, in terms of you know, a 50-year career in, in professional basketball. Not only was Colangelo a trailblazer for the Phoenix Suns, he also thought that baseball would improve Arizona. So Jerry Colangelo helped found a new MLB team, the Arizona Diamondbacks. But I truly believe baseball could have a tremendous impact on our community and in the entire Southwest part of the United States. And so we, we went after a franchise, we were awarded a franchise, we built a great stadium, um, and four years later we won a World Series. With his rising power in the sports industry, Colangelo was made the first managing director of the USA Basketball Men's Senior National Team Program. During Colangelo's tenure in this position, he restored the Olympic men's basketball team to gold medal status. As well as being the former owner of the Arizona Diamondbacks, the former general manager of the Phoenix Suns, and leading the USA to gold in the Olympics, Colangelo has served in numerous leadership roles for charitable foundations and community organizations. Jerry Colangelo has received multiple awards for his donations and charitable acts, one of them being the Spirit Caring Award from the Valley of the Sun United Way. That's how things are going to change. It's not just going to be by you know, having a plan and people just talking about a plan. You have to, you have to execute the plan and stay with it. Colangelo has exhibited a passion and love for athletics that has transcended the game. You know, it's about a passion that people have for their respective sport, for the university, for relationships, and that's what life is all about. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to receive this prestigious award and I feel nothing but humbled in doing so. You know, there's a lot of people we, we need to thank along the way. Coaches and mentors and people who had influence on, on your life. And um, that's certainly true in my life. There was a gentleman in our old Italian neighborhood who had a big impact on my life and he was a, an immigrant. He didn't have any education, but he was wise. And one night he was uh, mentoring some of the young fellows in the neighborhood, and he said to me in broken English, Jerry, do you see that star in the sky? And he was pointing to a particular star. And I said, Mike, I see it. And he said, remember, it's better to be on that star for one day than never get there at all. The birth of the Phoenix Suns in 1968, a baseball franchise in 1998, the Diamondbacks. I came back here in 2001, and I was introduced, I believe, right here in this uh, chamber. And uh, uh, the speaker said, you know, Jerry's one of us. He went to Bloom, he went to Illinois, he helped start the Bulls, he went to Phoenix, had all this success. And he got a baseball team. And in four years, he won a World Series. And he wasn't too happy about that because the Cubs hadn't won in 100 years. <laughs> and I happened to have grown up a Cub fan. And so he handed me the mic and I said, Mr. Speaker, I can relate to your, your problem. I said, do you realize I had to go out and buy a baseball team to win a game at Wrigley Field? <laughs> I have to leave you with... Uh, couple of things because I'm big on quotes. 
And boy, does Abe Lincoln have a lot of quotes. The best way to predict your future is to create it, Abe Lincoln. I change up on that a little bit in saying, don't wait for your ship to come in. You better swim out to it. Another Abe Lincoln quote, I do the very best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep on doing so until the end. I definitely believe that. Things may come to those who wait, but only the things left by those who hustle. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Edgar Curtis has devoted his career to serving others. President and Chief Executive Officer of Memorial Health System in Springfield, Curtis has served in a variety of management and administrative positions after beginning his career as a registered nurse. He shares his passion for the healthcare field by mentoring and coaching high school and college students, preparing for related careers. Ed has been honored in a number of ways, including with an honorary degree from the University of Illinois, which was given just a couple of years ago at the Springfield campus. To receive the Order of Lincoln from Springfield, Edgar Curtis. Edgar J. Curtis is the president and CEO of the Memorial Health System in the Central Illinois region. Curtis found a passion for nursing and the medical field early in his life. Curtis became a registered nurse in 1975. When I was in high school, I had this sense of immortality like all 15-year-olds. And I had somebody that meant everything to me that developed a terminal cancer and she was in her early 40s. And in those days, we didn't have palliative care or hospice care, and so she came to Memorial Medical Center, and probably for the last 100 days of her life, she was in the hospital. And that was my first exposure to being around a hospital as a 16-year-old. And I got to observe a lot of roles and see a lot of the way people treated others and the empathy shown by certain people, and I fell in love with the profession of nursing. At MHS, Curtis strives to create a culture and environment for his employees where they aim to learn as much as they can in their field and grow as individuals. I think culture defines the way, values define the way we care at our work, and those values create a culture in an organization. And the culture here is such that uh, it's a learning organization. And if you ask employees today on an annual survey, what's the number one rated question? Do I have an opportunity to learn and grow at Memorial? And that's what I've always experienced here, and I've always been afforded those opportunities to have an individualized leadership development plan that I could grow and learn from each and every year, and I still do today. Curtis is adamant about advancing the healthcare field to focus more on social aspects of health. He partnered with the Springfield YMCA to help serve in the community. Also, Curtis helped establish the Enos Park Initiative, which provides increased health care to lower-income neighborhoods. And we're very focused on the social determinants of health. Do people have a safe place to live? Do they have consistent meals? Do they have a job? Because if they don't meet those social determinants of health first, it's very hard for them to focus on getting medical care or getting a prescription filled, etc. So I see the medical school and the hospitals and the various communities we serve getting out of the neighborhoods, touching people's lives, going to them, trying to deal with some of those basic social determinants. And if we can deal with those first, we can keep them healthier so they don't need to come to the expensive hospital setting. I think that's where healthcare is going. Due to his work with the Central Illinois Food Bank and many other organizations, Curtis has received multiple awards for his philanthropy and leadership. I think it started when I got into nursing and, you know, love taking care of patients. I still love navigating for people and helping connect people to the right place. But I've learned a long time ago, we can't do this work alone. It's teamwork, it's partnerships, 
and you cannot fulfill our mission to improve one's health, as I said, if you don't have food, if you don't have jobs, if you don't meet some of these basic social service needs. And we need all those health and human service agencies to work with us. So I got involved in the United Way so I could get exposure to all the health and human service agencies initially and then fell in love with a couple of them like the Central Illinois Food Bank or the Springfield Urban League as a way just to give back but also connect those organizations to this organization to help them fulfill mission. Having grown up in Illinois and gone to school in Illinois, Edgar Curtis feels a strong connection to Mr. Abraham Lincoln. I do have tremendous admiration for our most famous president and I think it in his generation certainly wasn't called this but when you look at the power of Abraham Lincoln and the influence he had and think about um, how much he put others before himself he never was caught up in the trappings of the office of the presidency and even in being a wartime president uh, and the powers of being commander-in-chief during that time he still took time to write these phenomenal letters to maybe spare a soldier's life that had left the military that now was facing death, just always serving others. I was fortunate enough to be born, raised, and live my life in Springfield. I'm going to tell you about a life that ended and a woman whose death should be an inspiration to us all. Lisa was a kindergarten teacher in our community for more than 30 years. She could turn a quick stop at the grocery store into an hour-long visit because in aisle after aisle, she encountered former students eager to tell her about their life, their loves, their successes and sorrows, and how her kindness and patience had helped shape their adult lives. The book titled, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, sums up the value of Lisa's role in her students' lives. I had the privilege of being friends with Lisa and her husband, Todd, for many years. And like her family and friends, I was devastated to learn she had developed cancer. For more than two and a half years, I watched her battle cancer while enduring surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation oncology, and many hospitalizations and outpatient visits. I saw how deeply and selflessly our healthcare community cared for her, and I saw how deeply and selflessly she in turn cared for them. I watched as her husband held her hand through hours of treatments, how her children did everything they could to help occupy her mind and her time, and how her family and friends rallied around her through the highs and lows of what would be her toughest years on earth. So many people came forward in an effort to return to Lisa some of the love and care she had shown them. It was a display of how the servant leader who had dedicated her life to others, became the one being served. I can only pray when the good Lord decides my time has come that he blesses me with a circle of support filled with compassion, grace, and love. Because in the end, it's not about professional endeavors or personal victories. It's not education or credentials. It's not accomplishments or accolades. That is not what matters most. I challenge you today to join me in that undertaking as we form a community committed to living a life of service to others. Thank you. Sheila C. Johnson, a graduate of Proviso East High School and the University of Illinois at Bell and Champaign, Sheila Johnson has long been a powerful influence in the entertainment industry. Johnson was a founding partner of Black Entertainment Television and is currently CEO of Salamander Hotels and Restaurant. She was the executive producer of films that have been screened at Sundance and Tribeca Film Festivals and was involved in the creation of The Butler, directed by Lee Daniels. Her role in the entertainment industry also includes professional sports. Johnson is the only African-American woman who has ownership in three professional sports teams, the Washington Wizards, the Washington Capitals, 
and the Washington Mystics. A classically trained and accomplished violinist, Johnson actively supports numerous music, art, and educational philanthropies. To receive the Order of Lincoln from the Plains, Virginia, Sheila Johnson. Sheila Crump Johnson is the founder and current CEO of Salamander Hotels and Resorts. Johnson's love for music began at a young age where she found her muse in the violin. Okay, why did I choose music? Because it chose me in the fifth grade. It was free, it was something that the state mandated that all students should have some background in the arts, whether it be dance, whether it be chorus, whether it be music, and I decided to choose the violin. And from that point on, it was really the pinnacle of my life because I was able to carry it through all the way to I graduated from the University of Illinois. I was part of the Illinois String Research Project with Paul Rowland, and I have endowed chairs in his honor with Dan Perino and Susan Starrett. And so I am very committed to Illinois. Johnson graduated Proviso East High School in Illinois, where she moved on to receive her degree in music education from the University of Illinois. The violin and music gave Johnson many different opportunities in her life. The violin is the best instrument in the world. It's the most, one of the most complicated instruments. It really helped me focus. It gave me organizational skills. And I was able to do so much with it. It was not only to just perform in orchestras, but I also taught violin. I also went to uh, Jordan and with my orchestra to play, perform in the uh, oldest cultural festival in the Middle East. I traveled with Paul Rowland all over Europe and especially the UK where we taught this teaching of action of string playing. So it opened up many doors and many opportunities for me that I would have never even thought about. Along with her music career, Johnson has found success in the entertainment industry. Sheila Johnson was a founding partner of the cable channel Black Entertainment Television. You have to understand this is all part of entertainment, okay? I had my music career going and that was the time when all cable was coming through all the networks. It was from CNN to Nickelodeon and one thing I realized that there was not one cable network that really did address the African-American voice. And so we were able to take a proposal to John Malone. He financed us from the very beginning to the end. We sold to Viacom in 2002. But it's still going strong. It's probably the best brand out there for the African-American media. Johnson also originated the award-winning show Teen Summit that aired on BET as a way to motivate teen viewers. We were on the air for 11 years. We won every award in the book from the uh, ACE Awards all the way up to Emmys. Yeah, but it was a very, very important messaging program for young teens who could not really express themselves in any other medium. Sheila Johnson is the only African-American woman to have ownership of three professional sports teams, the NBA Washington Wizards, the NHL Washington Capitals, and the WNBA Washington Mystics. Johnson relates that she owes most of her success to the arts. And I have to credit my um, professors at the University of Illinois who were able to teach me and really help me in building this journey in my life. So I have to give credit to the arts. Even though Johnson was not born in Illinois, she still feels a great connection to the state as this is where she grew up. Last year I got the Lincoln Medal at Ford's Theater and uh, with Jack Nicholas, And uh, I thought that was a great honor, but it also in the same time, within two weeks after that, I found out I was getting this award. And I said, this is amazing. I'm all about Lincoln. And I just think it is just the greatest honor in the world to be able to come back to my state, because I consider this my state, because this is really where I grew up, and um, to be recognized in this way is just amazing. Good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to my fellow laureates. And I'd like to thank the Lincoln Academy of Illinois for this special honor. Now, I want to show you something. 
you see this? This, as you know, is the Lincoln penny. Now, this particular one happens to be dated 1958. You know, as I was sitting down and I was trying to figure out what was I going to say this evening, I took out a penny and I began to study it. Now, let me tell you what I learned and why. Financial considerations aside, the Lincoln penny is now my favorite form of U.S. currency. And while I now keep one as a reminder of who I am and where I came from. First, the Lincoln penny is money. And as you know, I am a businesswoman. On a penny, Mr. Lincoln is always facing to the right, which in a traditional linear timeline means he's forever facing forward and forever looking to the future. Today's penny is an amalgam of zinc and copper. But for two years during World War II, with copper in short supply, steel pennies were minted. Different makeup and a completely different color. But America's war effort never skipped a beat. The back of the penny has had three different designs beginning in 1909. Of those three, it was the first. The one on the back of the penny, I keep with me. That's my favorite. It's the version of the Lincoln penny that reminds me of my Midwest roots and the values of my mother and father instilled in me as a young girl in Maywood. And above all, while most things in America have a price, there are a few that should never and forever remain priceless. Freedom, the truth, and the right of every American, every last man and woman, to hold and speak his or her opinions, to pray to the God of his or her choice, and to love and be loved by whomever God sees fit to bring into their life. I can't thank you enough for this honor in this special evening. Thank you very much. Benjamin K. Miller, a native of Springfield, Illinois, received a Doctor of Jurisprudence degree from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee in 1961. He then returned to Springfield to begin his legal career in private practice. He would go on to serve as an outstanding prosecutor, circuit court judge, and appellate court justice. And in 1984, he was elected to the Supreme Court of Illinois and became Chief Justice on that court in 1991. Among the many positive accomplishments during his tenure as Chief Justice, Justice Miller developed programs to combat domestic violence, expand and strengthen local involvement in judicial performance evaluations, clarify restrictions on judicial political activities, and improve the Illinois juvenile justice system. Justice Miller also initiated the formation of the Illinois Family Violence Coordinating Council and convened the first Future of the Courts Conference. Following his three-year chief as justice, Justice Miller remained on the Supreme Court until his retirement in 2001. It is my personal honor and distinct privilege to introduce to you the Honorable Benjamin K. Miller, one of this year's 2019 recipients of the Order of Lincoln. Justice Benjamin K. Miller has committed his life to improving the quality of justice in Illinois. Justice Miller earned a bachelor's degree from Southern Illinois University Carbondale and a Juris Doctor degree from Vanderbilt University. No, it's just a general legal education, although I uh, was more interested in trial work than any other uh, area. Uh, when I finished at Vanderbilt, I came back here and uh, got an active uh, trial practice here in Springfield in Central Illinois. Miller's judicial career began when he was appointed to the Illinois 7th Judicial Circuit Court. 
Well, in uh, 1982, I was elected to the appellate court. I served on the trial court. I was appointed in 1976, elected in 1978. I tried the Pontiac prison case in Chicago for a year in 1980. I was elected to the appellate court in 82 and the Supreme Court in 84. Miller learned much from his criminal trial court experience. I was uh, head of the criminal division uh, while I was on the trial court because uh, when I was in practice, I did all civil trial work. So I had so many conflicts in, in the court when I left the practice to go to the court that I uh, did all criminal work, even though I didn't do that when I was in private practice. And it was a very interesting experience, uh, sad in a lot of ways because you saw a lot of uh, uh, sad situations, you know, criminal, both the defendants and the the uh, victims, and uh, it was a very interesting job. And uh, it was interesting, too, that you got to work with all the lawyers and uh, you know the juries and all that sort of thing. It was a very uh, good experience. Miller earned a reputation as an innovator while chairing the Illinois Courts Commission and pioneered domestic violence judicial reform as Chief Justice. Well, uh, until that point, we, we established the uh, Family Violence Coordinating Councils throughout the state. Um, before that, uh, family violence was considered kind of a, a secret or something, and uh, you know, a matter of it's between husband and wife and that sort of thing, and people wouldn't get involved in it. Um, and uh, about the time that uh, we started the uh, conferences, the coordinating conferences, councils. Uh, people became more aware that this is a public problem and very healthy and, you know, uh, and should be dealt with in a, in a broader perspective. Not just, it wasn't just the family involved, it was uh, society as a whole. Um, and uh, we discovered too that, that there, in the, if you had a family violence uh, situation, uh, part of it would be in a civil court, part of it would be in a criminal court, be all over, no, there was no coordination. So we uh, got the uh, players together, police, hospitals, doctors, courts, judges, lawyers, uh, and formed these uh, coordinating councils throughout the state. And uh, they worked together to have uh, a solution to this uh, family violence. Miller retired from the Illinois Supreme Court in 2001 but continues to draw inspiration from Abraham Lincoln's distinguished legal career. Well, uh, of course, when we get the award, we have to make some remarks, and uh, a good part of my remarks are going to be about Lincoln and his experiences and what we've learned, he learned from his practice and what we've learned from Lincoln, and uh, carry on from there. I've always felt the enduring presence of Abraham Lincoln, who still influences our civic life and the profession in which he served. Lincoln's life and character were performably shaped by the uh, world in which he practiced and from the lessons he learned from those experiences. His capacity for work, his deep understanding of human nature, and his gift for language, of course, were great ass assets as he traveled throughout the circuit and practiced in the courthouses of Central Illinois. Equally important are the hours of unbuilt pro bono work provided by members of the bar, which represent a major contribution by the legal profession to the public and to our system of justice. Last year, for example, the 540 lawyers at the Jenner Law Firm in Chicago provided more than 90,000 hours of pro bono service to members of the public who could not afford to pay. Combined, that is the equivalent to the work of 50 lawyers and associates of the firm working full time to provide legal services to those in need. Winston Churchill, an admirer of Lincoln, observed, we make a living by what we do, but a life by what we give. Lawyers are generous with their time and abilities, make for themselves a life, not merely a living, through pro bono work and by improving our system of justice through their work for the courts and the service to the bar. In giving me this honor for the work that I've done, you honor these lawyers as well. I thank you for that, and I thank you for this wonderful award.
Dr. Olufana Mayo of Old Potting is an internationally renowned expert in cancer risk assessment and individualized treatment of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer. Born in Nigeria, Dr. Olapati is the Walter Palmer Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine, and she's director of the Center for Clinical Cancer Genetics and Global Health at the University of Chicago. Since 1987, Dr. Olapati has sex successfully integrated research with patient care at the University of Chicago Medicine to create a comprehensive genomic cancer database. Olapati's study of the currents of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes in breast cancer cases worldwide. Based on an understanding of the genetic and the non-genetic factors in individual patients, she develops novel treatment and prevention strategies. To receive the organization from the Order of Lincoln from Chicago, Olufanati Pei Olupati. Born in Nigeria, Dr. Olufan Maleo Olopati is an internationally renowned expert in cancer risk assessment and preventative oncology. Dr. Olupati grew up in Nigeria and graduated from the University of Ibadan College of Medicine. Dr. Olupati moved to Chicago where she had accepted an internship at John H. Stroger Cook County Hospital. We came to discover America. We traveled to five states that we had read about but didn't actually know. And that really got me thinking, wow, this is God's own country. <laughs> because that was sort of what we thought about America. Um, uh, while in medical school, we had American students who came as part of the Peace Corps. Um, I played sports, and so they were part of our sports team because they were tall and they helped us in basketball. So I had a familiarity with America that was really fun growing up, even though uh, most of our education was towards the British system. Curiosity for knowledge and wanting to use research to cure cancer led Dr. Olupati to accepting the fellowship in Chicago. My intellectual curiosity got me thinking that I need to do more research because I had been trained as a clinician, as a doctor, and I knew I could practice medicine anywhere. But my basic fundamental knowledge of science was not as advanced as my colleagues who had trained in the U.S. And so I, I applied for fellowship training in oncology. I saw that, you know, we had a chance with research to cure cancer. Dr. Olopati originally wanted to be a cardiologist, but when she came to Chicago, she realized her calling was for oncology and aiding the fight against cancer. So I came really thinking I wanted to be a heart specialist uh, because the kinds of heart problems that I saw in Nigeria were children who had heart damage because they had rheumatic fever, right? And by the time I got to the United States, penicillin and antibiotics had basically solved that problem. So there was really no, not many people who were coming in with rheumatic heart disease. And then I thought, wow, you know, if just finding the right antibiotics could eliminate what I thought was a huge problem in Nigeria, then maybe I should think about something even much more technically challenging, and that was cancer. I saw that, you know, there was uh, children with Bucket's lymphoma who, when you gave them chemotherapy, the tumor melted. And so I wanted to learn why that happened. And the only way I could learn that was to go to a research university because I had heard of the amazing work that my mentor, uh, Dr. Rowley, was doing to understand the genetic underpinnings of cancer. And so think, still thinking I was going to return to Nigeria, I just wanted to learn from the master, the best. And so I went into the lab to learn the genetic basis of cancer. And what we were doing in those days was mapping one gene at a time. We did not have the Human Genome Project at the time. Uh, but pioneers like Dr. Rowley, who I would say exemplify the best Illinois could produce, 
really uh, went to Congress and said, let's just sequence all the genes. And that's how we began to understand all the different genetic abnormalities in cancer. After seeing all the destruction cancer has done to many lives, Dr. Olupati decided to aid many boards and multiple foundations, including the Healthy Life for All Foundation. These organizations connected to Abraham Lincoln in a special way, as his character is one of Olupati's inspirations. So, you know, thinking about the way Abraham Lincoln led his life, his character, his passion, his commitment, the fact that he kept the union together is really what motivates me every day to say this is not about blue state and red state. This is about America. This is about the amount that we have put into science and technology. This is about uniting us to eradicate cancer. And I am truly honored that the work that I have done actually is become commonplace in oncology because of the activism of people in Illinois. Thank you very much for bestowing me with the State of Illinois' highest award of individual achievement that honors the legacy of a great president and moral leader, Abraham Lincoln. I was fortunate to have landed at Cook County Hospital where 98% of the patients were black or uninsured. And they certainly taught me what it was like to be in an America that had two different types of health system. Since my time at Cook County Hospital, I've been fortunate to go to the University of Chicago to learn from the best. Think critically about the issue of health equity and access. What role can you play? What difference can you make? We must find a way to truly democratize access to affordable health care, and it starts with each one of us. Is health a human right? Do we respect the dignity of every human being? As a nation, I hope we can come together to fight stigma, hatred, and all prejudices that prevent us from realizing the vision of the greatest son of Illinois. Abraham Lincoln would have surely wanted us to find a way to forge fearlessly ahead and make our scientific discoveries discoveries benefit all of humanity, not just the privileged. Thank you. George Will is a Pulitzer Prize winning syndicated columnist for the Washington Post. For his towering intellect and libertarian principles have been on fearless display since 1974. Many of you will likely recognize him from his role as a multi-platform commentator for NBC News and MSNBC, and some may actually remember him as a founding member of the panel of commentators on ABC's This Week with David Brinkley. He's had a truly remarkable career. Indeed, the Wall Street Journal called him perhaps the most powerful journalist in America, and that was 33 years ago. Born and raised in nearby Champaign, he spent many de decades as a long-suffering Cubs fan. Ladies and gentlemen, to receive the Order of Lincoln from Washington, D.C., George Will. Champaign native George F. Will has been one of the most recognizable and respected conservative commentators on the American political scene for decades. He's earned a well-deserved reputation as an engaging, insightful guest who can speak on practically any topic with precision, candor, and a deeply informed historical perspective. Well, do something usually means get the government to do something. Doing nothing means let the market do the wondrous things that it can do. 
A passionate fan since childhood, Will happily traces his interest in conservatism to his lifelong love of baseball. Grew up in Champaign County, midway between Chicago and St. Louis, where the dividing line is between Cardinal fans and Cub fans. And at an age too young to make life-shaping decisions, I had to choose. I choose to be, chose to be a Cub fan. All my friends became Cardinal fans and grew up cheerful, happy, and liberal. And I became a gloomy conservative because the Cubs until 2016 were not very good. His deep Illinois roots also helped nurture a lifelong appreciation for the legacy of President Abraham Lincoln. Well, to grow up in central Illinois is to be marinated in Lincoln spirit. We Every year at University of Illinois High School, we get in uh, red Ford station wagons, as I recall, and drive to Springfield and visit the tomb, rub the nose on the, the, the bust of Abraham Lincoln. It, it just, you breathe it in, it's like a fish in water, you almost don't notice it, but it's there. And it conditions your sense of public service, of bravery, of prudence. Lincoln had to manipulate and maneuver with complex reality and a clear principle. And that's what statesmanship is, to have principles, to, but to accommodate untidy reality. Will graduated from Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and earned a doctorate from Princeton University before arriving in Washington as a Senate staff member in 1970. He served as Washington editor of the National Review, a leading conservative journal of ideas and political commentary from 1973 to 1976. Will is a prolific writer of books ranging from politics and political theory to baseball. His most recent book is The Conservative Sensibility. People think conservatives only want to conserve and they want to conserve the past. American conservatism is precisely the reverse. It is to preserve a society open to perpetual dynamic change. To do that, you have to go back to the past. You have to conserve the founders vision, which was natural rights, limited government, and separation of powers. Growing up not far from the site of one of the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates helped inform his own appreciation for the true leadership abilities of our nation's 16th president. The important thing in America is not majority rule, it is liberty. We like majority rule because it serves liberty and when it serves liberty. And his ascent to greatness as the in my judgment, the greatest political career in the history of world politics began, if local lore is right, in the Urbana Square of Champaign County Courthouse. Beyond politics, Will has written extensively about his beloved sport of baseball. For Will, there's a reason it's America's favorite pastime. The enduring qualities of the players and the game have so much in common with the people and the country where it all started. I, I, I think so. First of all, it's individualism. We're an individualist society. Individual striving is the essence of the American experience. But it's also a team game. The individual battles one man against one pitcher. It's a funny game because the action starts with the defense holding the ball, throws it down at a 17-inch wide plate. But it's also a team game. Everyone has to function together to make it happen. But beyond that, I think baseball's the right sport for a democracy because it's the sport of the half loaf. No one gets everything they want. Best team in baseball and the worst team in baseball both go to spring training basically knowing they're going to win 60 games, they're going to lose 60 games. Play the whole season, 162 games in 183 days, six months, to sort out the middle 42 games. If you win 10 out of 20 games, you're definitionally mediocre. If you win 11 out of 20 games, you win 87 games, you're on the outskirts of the postseason. So it's a lesson in, in accepting a lot of failure in life. I mean, Ty Cobb, greatest hitter in baseball history in terms of career batting average, 367, I think it was. That means more than 60% of the time he failed. So you get used to it. Chancellor, members of the Academy, distinguished guests, 
I cannot tell you adequately how much this award means to me. I've not lived in the state of Illinois since Je September 1958, when four months past my 17th birthday, I went away to college. I have never, however, not once ever, thought of myself as other than a son of the prairies of Illinois, a son of the American middle border, uh, to which it is always a delight to return. The um, remarkable thing about the state of Illinois is that it is the beating heart of the country. The Midwest begins on the western slope of the Alleghenies and stretches to the eastern slope of the Rockies, but the heart of the matter is the Mississippi Valley and the beating heart of the Mississippi Valley is the great state of Illinois. Uh, in the early 1920s, there was uh, the greatest right-handed hitter in the history of baseball, Rogers Hornsby, was at the plate. And there was a rookie pitcher on the mound who was quite understandably petrified. And he threw three pitches that he thought were strikes, and the umpire said, ball one, ball two, ball three. The rookie got flustered and shouted into the umpire, said, umpire, those were strikes. The umpire took off his mask, looked out at the picture, and said, young man, when you throw a strike, Mr. Hornsby will let you know. Hornsby had become the standard of excellence. It's an American aspiration for all of us. And there is no more vivid example of American excellence than Abraham Lincoln. And all of us who are privileged to be inducted in this ceremony into the company, as it were, of Abraham Lincoln are duly chastened and duly inspired. And again, I thank you so much for this. I'm the last of your laureate speeches for which you can ha sigh with relief. Uh, none of us will ever tire of being associated now forever with the beating heart of Illinois, which is the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. Again, I thank you very much. It is now a privilege for me to introduce the president of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, the 43rd governor of the state of Illinois for his remarks. Governor Pritzker. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Marshall. And um, I want everybody to take note of the amazing service that Dr. Marshall has given as the Chancellor of Lincoln Academy and thank her for her service. This is, of course, my first convocation as governor, and it brings me such pride to represent a state that is so intent on honoring those who have dedicated their lives to the betterment of humanity. This is the Illinois that I know a place where the people are audacious enough to believe that they can make a difference and courageous enough to be kind. We are here tonight to celebrate the legacy of our state's own Abraham Lincoln, whose character, vision, and principles shaped the story of our nation in its darkest hours. But the true strength of legacy comes not only from our achievements, but the examples that we leave for those who come next. And that, to me, is the most fundamental tenet of the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. Our 16th president himself named it as his own mission in the Gettysburg Address. In the unfinished work of our time, what wisdom and inspiration do we leave for future generations? How do we ensure that they walk through life convicted of the endless possibilities ahead? These are the greatest legacies of our newest six laureates. We're here tonight to celebrate six people who serve as living testaments to what Lincoln knew then and what we know today. The greatest strength of our country and our state is our people. 
As you've heard, these individuals represent the highest ideals of their respective callings. Their successes, their service, their leadership have all played a role in shaping the world as we know it today. Their formal expertise ranges across 11 named categories, agriculture, the arts, business and industry, education, law, labor, sciences, religion, social services, and sports. Their informal interests, passions, and curiosities span countless more. As president of the Lincoln Academy and as your governor, it is my honor to add six more names to that list of great Illinoisans. In shaping your story, you have shaped the lives of countless others. It is because of your work that I too can say, I have faith in the people and especially the people of Illinois. Thank you.